Welcome again, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. We got a repeat guest today. We have historian Chris Dodge, a.k.a. Habta Selassie, except this time we didn't come to talk to you about Ethiopian history. We came to talk to you about a little MBA history. So Last Dance, the popular uh, documentary on Michael Jordan, the GOAT, and the, the folks that were with him along the way, Scotty Pimpin, um, you know what I'm saying, uh, Dennis Rodman, Steve Kerr, all the group, Phil Jackson, all the characters that you see there ha is on Netflix. And that coincides with the restarting of this very funky NBA season, which has just started. Chris's uh, squad for now, the Lakers, will beat my squad by uh, on the hair of their chinny-chin-chin, chin, the, the, the Clippers. But we'll get into all sorts of stuff. I think you wanted to talk about goats and legends, right? I've also written down a, a short list of some of my favorite characters, some of which may give you some eyebrow raisers. But I think we're going to have a nice, natural, organic, organic conversation on the matter. So Chris, uh, holla at us and let us let us know. Haven't talked hoops with you before. Uh, I do know you have an eclectic uh, 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 brand of some of some colorful players that you like. And so I definitely appreciate the, the range this conversation might have. Um, I was late to watch Last Dance. I was happy to get to see it on Netflix because it was it was blocked out for me for a while. And you know, like a lot of people in my 30s, I grew up you know, with that really tangibly there and remember it firsthand. In fact, it kind of watching it made me forget because my memories are so attached to like the first bowl team when I was a little kid, like how much a lot of that happened when I was in high school. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that happened then? That was that year? And so like, you know, The Last Dance, I think is a great opportunity to reflect not just on Michael Jordan and the GOAT, because I mean, I'm gonna be honest, like Last Dance seals the deal for that discussion. But I think in basketball, the biggest tragedy of the Jordan stand is the failure to acknowledge that the gap between the goat and the baby goats isn't as far as people want to pretend it is. For example, one of the things that said to me in that documentary is how much Michael Jordan was chasing Magic Johnson throughout his career, right down to when he got the sixth. What did he say right the sixth? He said, got six, Magic didn't get that. Like, in his mind, in his OCD, in his competitiveness, like, he still needed to top Magic even – towards the end of Michael Jordan being peak Jordan. And so, like, I think that in itself lets people see the insight that, like, while Jordan is indisputably the greatest player of all time, even he knows that, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth, baby goat are, are not as far from him. And They're not as far from him, but what I liked about the documentary is you had explicit acknowledgement, both from Magic Johnson and from Larry Bird, that Jordan is above and beyond. In the world of jujitsu, you see that with a character named Hickson Gracie. Everyone acknowledges him as the GOAT in that sport. And when everyone who has all these huge egos acknowledges one dude, that tells you something. That bears evidence. And the interesting thing is Larry Bird even beat him in that early on uh, in, uh, in the playoff series that they had before Jordan had the great backup players that he had that really made the, those six championships worth it later. But even when beating Jordan, Larry Bird was like, man, this guy's something else with those 50, 60 point games. Well, you know, I mean, and magic said, and magic said in there when he was congratulating Jordan in one of those championships, he saw magic come in in the nineties. Uh, maybe it was 92 or 93, like saying something in the nature of sarcasm. Like he was glad he got his, but you know, before, before Jordan figured it all out. Um, so definitely, I think it's indisputed among people who played against Michael Jordan how great he was. But I think, again, when talking about it as fans, it's a disservice to basketball as a whole to like act like all you should talk about is Michael Jordan. The purpose of a conversation or a dialogue about who's the greatest ever is to have a conversation about basketball, not just Michael Jordan. And that's where yeah. the whole term stand comes from, which is like, oh, you just want to talk about Michael. But like, what makes Michael great is basketball as a whole and other teams that it plays. So like, for example, that's why I like the theme of this conversation to be like goat and baby goats. Like you get to see all of the other really great players and teams that were part of before and during Michael Jordan's era and a little bit after to really give you that perspective of like, you know, what makes Jordan so great is that he is better than so many really great basketball players and teams. So talk to me about talk to me about some specific factors of him. You know his offense, his defense. What is it? His motivation, the way he runs. You know the court, his IQ on the court. Tell me or his EQ. Tell me what you think makes him a goat, and then let's jump into some people you consider baby goats. All right. So I think what makes Michael Jordan indisputably the goat was 
his inability to lose and his talent to pull out a win. In hindsight, the romantic version of Michael Jordan is to forget the times that his team was down in a series or down in a game and just pull something out of their ass. We're talking hoops, so our language might reflect that. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, when you watch Michael Jordan play live, there, it, there still was a chance he could lose this or that game or this or that series. And that yeah. he won is then what makes him so indisputably the GOAT. Like, yeah. you know, Magic Johnson and the Showtime Lakers. That team is still, in my opinion, a more dominant team than the 90s Bulls. They went to 11 Western Conference Finals in 13 years, right? They went to nine NBA Finals in 11 years. They won five of, five of them. In other words, if you needed to get the trophy, you had to get it from Magic Johnson. Now, did he win every trophy? No. And I think that's what's unfair, that Jordan won the ones he went to. So we have this idea that you need to win them all. But in basketball, nah, man, second place, that guy counts too because you had to get it from him. So, like, people want to knock LeBron right now because he's lost in finals. But if I'm LeBron, I'm like, listen, I may have lost, but you got it from me. I didn't lose no first round. I didn't lose no second round. The person In Miami, movie, in Cleveland, and me. in Los Angeles. And yeah. so that, that's, that's impressive. So LeBron, in addition to maybe Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, would you add him to your list of baby goats? Is he above so, uh, and the go to? To kind of finish that thought of what makes Jordan so separate from anyone else we're going to talk about is, again, just that, that Jordan won and, and, and winning counts. So, like, even when I'm talking with football and my man Lamar Jackson, like, I love, I'm, you know, Baltimore Ravens. I love Lamar Jackson. What he's doing. My, my disappointment as a fan of the Baltimore Ravens is that, that Lamar Jackson's won 21 football games but ain't won two playoff games. And in football, January is what counts. That's where the trash talk is. That's where, like, you silence your, your critics when you say – yeah, we won that game. And winning counts. And for me, that's what makes Jordan just of above any other GOAT who's even near him is that he didn't lose. He won these games that he had to win. And when you watch the last dance, you see there were games that he could have lost. And I think the mystique of him not losing them makes people forget in hindsight that he could have lost them. And the, and the vulnerability of being close to losing a few of those big games in the series is why he just kept winning people over to say, nah, you can't beat this guy. So each time that he won a big game in the finals or the playoffs getting there, like just solidified is like, this guy's incredible because the guys before him had those vulnerable moments where they lost. The, yeah. the Magic Johnson, the Magic Johnsons like lost some finals, right? The Larry Birds, the Kareems, like, you know, the, the, the big names of the 70s and 80s. Will Chamberlain, like these guys are really great players and have their spot on the greatest of all time list if there wasn't Michael Jordan, who, unlike them, won all those games. So I guess the, the segue to how do I start adding baby goats to the goat list is, you know, it, it's impossible to say a top 10 list because basketball is so diverse in regards to what players are asked to do and, yeah, and what and the positions. team sport is. So I prefer to do, do something like the all-NBA format. So I call it my all-time first team my all-time second team, my all-time third team. And it's ranked by position. And that way, it's so much easier to debate a player's value over another because you're no longer saying a shooting guard versus a center. It's shooting guard versus shooting guard, point guard versus point guard. So who's your starting five by position? Who's your yeah, bench by position? B before who's you go into the positions, um, the, the great boxing coach uh, that was with, uh, you know, it was assistant trainer of um, Mike Tyson, is about to fight again soon against Ray Jones Jr. Teddy Atlas, he said exactly what you said, that what makes you great is that you go through adversity. He His assessment of Mike Tyson is that he lacks in, in GOAT conversations. What he lacks in the conversations about the GOAT is that every time that he thinks that Mike Tyson faced adversity, he actually lost versus you know everyone else. He just kind of pummeled easily. But in the moments where he was tried, he didn't get through the fire. And what you're saying is Michael um, Jordan not only just, you know, ran roughshod over people, but there were times where he very possibly could have lost, that it was close, that there were key moments where, to use a history analogy, right, there's the forces of nature history argument, and then there's the great man theory. Well, Michael Jordan is one of those people that would be a part of the great man theory. Yes, because he through his singular talent and perfectionism to his craft, 
was able to elevate his game in those moments. I think what created his mystique was he also never turned it off in some meaningless regular season game on a Thursday. And he, and he in the last dance said his quote of that is like, hey, some guy in that arena didn't see me play before. I'm going to give him my best. I think that what makes people upset about basketball now, like even the Lakers game last night, like they want to see that again, but they forget what's about basketball is like, man, Michael Jordan didn't play in the HD video scouting era where like you didn't want to give everything you have in a meaningless mm. game on a Thursday night. Because then that playoff team's gonna have that scouting report in very detail. It's gonna make your and life data scientists. Data like, people don't talk enough yeah. about the data scientists who are working for these teams. I heard one person say something controversial enough where they believe basically whichever team has the best data scientists is winning going forward. That's only part of the game. I mean, so for example, we could talk about that Miami Heat with LeBron. They were uh, they were one of those stat junkie teams, and they brought Shane Battier in. Who would get who himself had his own little scouting team to put together binders before each game and pass out assignments to get people there where their offensive efficiency was the highest and also the offensive efficiency of the opposing team so they could focus their defense. In other words, like that Miami Heat team's goal was okay, you know, uh, uh, Mike Miller, you shoot 43% at this part of the court. We're going to try to get you the ball there, or more specifically, if you have your hand on the ball and that's part of the court, you got free range to shoot it. Like, but if you shoot 32%, you need to pass that ball because you know that Ray in the other corner shoots 50% there. So in other words, they were moving the ball to find efficiency. And on defense, they were picking on guys where they were least efficient. Their goal was to trap and rotate to get the ball to the least efficient part on the other guy's team. And so like your pet plays, your system, in this modern era, era of NBA, you got to be really careful how much you reveal in the regular season. And so we've really seen that change in the past five years and 10 years of, of the quality of some regular season matchups of really good teams. And like, that's that switch in the playoffs. But look at the difference. 1992, you know, you might be lucky if somebody VH test a halftime scouting report to do an in-game adjustment. Now homie's coming out with the iPad, like in the middle of the quarter, like what happened 30 seconds ago? is breaking down like really smart. So I think what separated the Michael Jordan kind of players of their era was they had that court vision. Like what makes LeBron a unique great is he'll tell you about some random game and what some player was doing in the second quarter like 10 years ago because he remembers it. He's yeah, I've seen him I've basketball. seen him in post-game interviews. Yeah. It, it had me shook. Like he just remembers that stuff. Like he's not showing off. He didn't look in a book. Like his brain just remembers basketball that way. And so like that's what great players like him in the past could do. They didn't need a great video booth guy. They just remembered it, and they knew what to do. Jordan's one of those guys. Like, he knew what guys were going to do. But now, any third string guy has a lot of that same access to information that previously only the all-time greats had. And so I think the all-time greats right now realize, hey, save it, because you're going to show everything, and it's going to hurt you in the future. I can agree from a competitive standpoint that that's a little bit unfair to, you know, the idea of the product on the court. On well, the same token, we have to accept basketball is a lot more athletic than it was in the past. And these guys, you know, do got to save a little bit of it to give us the best show we want in the playoffs. And people want to see the playoffs more, and they're going to give you more slack if you lose one. Jordan rolls that bar up. Now dudes can't even lose a game in the playoffs without being scathed on their Wikipedia page. So guys are really saving it for that. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, Jordan's singular greatness was to just – do that and like you said be the man be be the guy who just made the play and sometimes they weren't shots you know as much as we remember him for being this cold-blooded shooter in the end of the game how many of these all-time great games come from passing to Paxson or passing to Kerr right passing up that shot even when he'll say hey games on who's get the shot Jordan but that's his whole psychological warfare of wanting the other team to assume Jordan would never pass the ball meanwhile Jordan's not stupid he is a good basketball player. And indeed, I think what elevates Jordan from losing to Larry Bird to beating everybody senselessly was the triangle offense, which was really a, a proto version of modern pace and space, which is emphasis on very coordinated ball movement and creativity from that and using spacing. Now, they were using mid-range spacing because they had the unique talent of having some really great mid-range scorers like Jordan, who was just indomitable from 15, 20 feet, right? So they weren't necessarily using three-point spacing, but they were doing a version of spacing by moving the ball a little bit away from the basket to open it up in the era where they still had twin towers out there. 
And so, like, it's this proto version of what makes basketball great now, which is ball movement and spacing. And that's what elevated Jordan. And that also requires high IQ. You know, when Phil Jackson implements the triangle in the Lakers, that's a complaint a lot of people had. Like, it's a very complicated system. Phil Jackson the last dance is bragging about how excited he was that the fullest of the triangle came out on the Jordan retirement years. Because I remember from the documentary, he said something like, there's 36 options on every pass in the triangle to create something. And when they didn't have Jordan, they could really milk those options while they were playing on the court. And so like when, when you saw the reflections from the players during that, that, that 94, 95 year without Jordan, like that was a whole different feel from the team because the triangle was able to do really what it was designed to do, which was move the ball, be efficient, create mismatches, open up the floor. But I guess let's dive into the goats and the baby goats, you know, for our take of time. Let's do it. I, I, I'm going to throw some names at you. Reserve your judgment till the end and tell me to explain whichever one and then we could jump into it. So for me, I have, you know, some of these people might be considered actual baby goats. Some of them for me are just my favorite players. Okay. So that, that's my different lens. I know you've got the lens of baby goat and I have part of that in here. But for me, and I could explain any and all of them, but a lot of these cats is just my personal favorites. And I'm wearing the jersey of one of them. This is a Warriors jersey, but I'm not a Warriors fan. And it's not Steph Curry, all right? This is Rick Barry. So Rick Barry is one of them, reserve judgment. MJ is, of course, up there. Shaquille O'Neal. I have to give respect to Kobe, but I give preference to Shaquille O'Neal. Sean Kemp, Blake Griffin, Reggie Evans, Dennis Rodman, Andre Iguodala, Tony Allen, Baron Davis, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I, I, I'm guessing Kareem and maybe Shaq or Kobe are on your short list as well. The others, probably not. Oh, I can see, I, I can see your argument for several of those players. It's also funny, when I was walking, Savion, for his nap time, thinking about this conversation, I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, the 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 white players that make it on my list. Oh and, yes, and, and the, and I, you saw that, that I added one. <laughs> yeah, and the fact that and the fact that there's a very few of them, and that the ones that are on there are on there because they're that good. And then yep. you think about well, who's the white goat list? <laughs> and I went uh, down the list. Larry, where, like, Larry the Bird, white players like Pete Maravich yeah. and oh, and, so, and uh, yeah. Dirk Nowitzki, Larry, has Larry Bird. I don't know why I cannot forget his name. It's been bugging me all day, and I should have done my homework before we came on here. But but the. Other white guy from the Celtics who was coaching the Rockets. Bill Walton? No. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about, man? He's, he, oh, my God. It's bugging me because I don't want – for me to not remember his name is disrespectful because he was a bad man with the basketball, by the way. He was uh, in the Celtics. How, how about uh, – uh, um, I'm, I'm bugging right now. Carl Malone's partner on the Jazz. That's John Stockton. He's on John my list Stockton. of the all-time white guys. Exactly. Yeah. John Stockton's or white, on there. Jason Kidd. White, how about white chocolate? It's funny. I already knew you'd say that. I was like, I'm going to put Jay Will on there only because he impressed people so much, but I think he's more like. Oh, yeah, Jason like Williams. Him. I was conflating Jason Williams with Jason Kidd, too. I, th I think that Jason Williams was, was a great basketball player. I don't think he's the caliber of some of the white ghosts like Pistol P and Larry Legend and, and those guys, but I certainly know he's on there because he was a fan favorite. But like the very fact that I'm going to have a guy like Larry Bird and John Stockton on my all time list is a testimony to how good they are not racially just, just period because these other yeah. players are that much better than them but so like my all-time list against by position so let's just do an order point guard magic johnson i mean it, it, no dispute, the best no dispute guard, johnson, they don't know basketball Simple i have i that. have no dispute i have no dispute like there are definitely cool point guards that are similar but magic is magic for a reason and magic had that talent that jordan had of just pulling games out of his ass and winning Six foot Shooting nine, guard. bro. Six foot nine who could dribble like that, pass like that. Yeah. Oh, so many parts of LA used to grow up going to the Magic Johnson theaters with the voice. No, Magic's an LA legend. When I was at the last Laker parade, I didn't even care about Kobe and Powell. I was like, Magic, I love you. Yeah. So, I, no, no, no dispute on my end there. Michael Jordan, shooting guard. In, no other words, this is the, in other words, this is the starting team that will beat any other team and any other configuration of teams in the history of the NBA. Magic so far, no dispute. Guard. One and two were the same. I got no disputes. All right, and, and Michael Jordan's a shooting guard. 
Your small forward, and this only changed from 2016, your small forward is going to be LeBron James. He officially took over Larry Legend's position as the greatest small forward when he beat Golden State and got that third chip. And then the cumulative effect of his talent and contributions give him that status. My small you know what's my funny? No, 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 no dispute on number three either. That means our, our top three are the same. The only thing I'll say is LeBron's one of those dudes that you could throw around at different positions. True. My power forward is going to be the funda big fundamental Tim Duncan. Now, I know he played some of his career as a center, but his peak is a power forward. No, and he's a four. My... He's a four for me. And here we do have some dispute, but I absolutely respect the legend, Timmy D. And the hardest... I think, I mean, I don't even like Tim Duncan because I'm a Laker fan and we hate the Spurs and we especially hate Tim Duncan. I won't be very You got to respect fair. Mr. Fundamental. You got to respect like, Tim, Tim Duncan's like a Tom Brady. I have no love for Tim Duncan in my heart, but I respect the man. And yeah. his, his you, rookie you of the year. You got to respect the man who uses the bank like that, bro. Just his all around talent. Like people that didn't see Tim Duncan play basketball in his five year peak between 99 and 2005, uh, three, like, don't know why he is. A goat worthy player. 2003, bro. It goes much longer than that. No, Didn't like, they that's that? like that's when yeah. you were seeing Tim Duncan get like 10 block games, triple doubles, yeah. like like young Tim Duncan before they decided for him to become more of a system player. That was very that that was a goat worthy player. The problem is Tim Duncan realized his talent was longevity and becoming a system player and kind of turned it down a notch and he, and he traded he traded individual success for team success. So he's, he dad, has something that he shares with Rick Barry, who's on my list of favorite, not necessarily best players, but favorite players just for like basketball EQ or IQ. He has no care for the glamour. He oh, has yeah. no care. Like this whole debate of functionality versus form that exists in so many different industries. He does not give one F what you think about his game, his style, whatever. He does what is purely efficient, almost like in a mechanized manner. I'm sure he likes to put him on our list, though. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. He's still a superstar <laughs> player. He's still got an ego. Like, I'm sure he still loves that we put him on a list above a lot yeah. of great power forwards that are like him. I think, the, honestly, the most debatable position is the center because there's so many all-time great centers that, that we could argue this list. So oh, well, like, let me uh, l let me let me hear your number five because one through three we have no arguments. One one through three, uh, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, LeBron James in those positions, the point guard, shooting guard, small forward, no disputes. I think four and five is uh, is that called the front court or that's the front court, yeah, right? Or is that the that's back the court? front court? Yeah, the front court is where we would have, I think, potential disagreements. I'll I'll throw just for the sake of uh, devil's advocate an argument, an argument for a different number four. But let's hear your number five first. My number four is flexible. I give it to Timmy when I zoom out and think about the totality of his career, his, his impact on the court, him being one of the best players in the court in a 2014 finals against an all time great team when he's, you know, an old man. Like, I, 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 I upped my respect for Tim Duncan in the 2013-14 finals when he still had a lot of gas in the tank that he shouldn't have had. I go think go to the number, number five. five. We'll come back to Timmy D. We'll come back to number five's gotta number five. Be, number five's got to be Kareem, who was the original GOAT before Jordan. We're talking about the all-time score in an era before mm -hmm. three-pointers even were on anybody's radar, let alone for a center. We're yep. talking about a guy who dominated college sport and professional sport who was Rookie of the Year, who has as many MVPs as Jordan. Uh, I think that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the most underrated basketball superstar in the history of the sport simply because he became overshadowed by guys that were as good as him. And he also doesn't have he, – he's kind of Tim Duncan. -y. He doesn't have the personality to be a superstar. And he's a little bit of a curmudgeon. Like, he's not a likable guy sometimes, so he can come across the wrong way. And when people want fan favorites, it wasn't Kareem. And so, like – People acknowledged him as the GOAT until Jordan took the title from him in the 90s. And somehow he got knocked way down the list. And, like, young, young folks need to know that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was as unstoppable as people remember Michael Jordan being unstoppable. So I developed my basketball game in the early 90s and the 2000s based off of his hook shot. I grew up loving him deeply. My pops went to school with him at UCLA at the same time. So I love that he's a Bruin, like my pops and my moms were both Bruins. And then I love that after being a Bruin at UCLA, he was on the Lakers for a long time. I love that he had those goggles because I've had vision problems. I'm healed now, but I had vision problems in the past and I've had to hoop with goggles. So UCLA, Lakers, hook shot, 
all-time score. That's a very specific stat you quoted, like all-time score. All those things. And he he was in L.A., so he was in Hollywood. He was in a lot of, like, he had a lot of cameos in different even cartoons and TV shows. Like, that used to be dope that he used to watch growing up. So he's up there for me. He's also a very articulate brother. Right, um, very very he, smart, sophisticated. And I think that's why he gets underrated as a basketball player because he chose to spoke his mind about some articulate things that, that people really wanted to shut up and dribble mentality. And, and, and he was part of these black nationalist movements, right? Like with the NOI mm -hmm. where he changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar from Lou Alcindor. And mm -hmm. he pissed a lot of white folks off when he changed his name that way. I think uh, in a similar fashion to the way we saw Muhammad Ali. Uh, obviously, Muhammad Ali got in trouble with Johnny Law a little bit more than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So here's what we're going to do. Since we're on Kareem, we'll go here and then we'll go backwards to number four. This is where there's going to be the most debate. And uh, we won't go too much further, but we'll debate the five and four because one through three were the same. And then we might give some shout outs to some other people. So tell me why Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is better than... Hakeem the Dream, David Robinson, and or Shaq. So take any See, of them. This, this is why I have a second and third team. I personally, my favorite basketball player of all time is Shaq. I love Shaq and LeBron as my two favorites because they are such similar personalities. I don't think there's in the history of basketball any two guys that have had more genuine fun as superstar oh, yeah. professional athletes than Shaq and LeBron. Like those guys do not take their job serious. They have fun with it. They acknowledge that they are best professionals but they know that it's the kind of job we should be having some fun with. And, and like, I love Shaq as a kid. When Shaq came to L.A., it was a big deal for us in L.A. And it was a big deal for me as a basketball fan. And I love the Shaq era. You know, I follow Shaq to Miami. When he, when he left L.A., I was Man. so mad at Kobe and Phil for chasing and away Shaq. I was like, I even enjoyed him in Cleveland for a few minutes, man. I was in yeah. road 10, Cleveland, Shaq, and LeBron because that. I was looking for him with the Celtics, man. He hurt my feelings with that one. I let it slide because I he love did Shaq. Too. He did too, but he had, a, his... he had cute moments too where he let Nate Robinson dunk on him in practice yeah. back then on the Celtics. I, I also let his, I let his, uh, I let his cop-friendly vibes go too because I, I feel like Shaq don't know better right now because he's really a kind of country dude from Louisiana. But I think that, you know, Shaq would be the best center of all time if he gave a fuck about basketball. But oh the problem God. with Shaq is he was not a skilled basketball player. When you watch Shaq play basketball, it's ugly. His rebounding has no technique. His shot is like the ugliest thing in the world. His fundamental skill set is garbage. Like Shaq dominated like Mike Tyson on sheer athleticism, willpower, and physicality. And he dominated. Had yeah. he cared about like shooting and like rebounding, he would have been like Wilt. He would have had like 50, 20 games on the norm. If he kept that body from when he was on Magic, that athletic build yes. that he had on Magic, and he built on it and worked out instead of getting a little, a little chubby. But and I'll tell you this, he's not the best too. center of all time, maybe, but he is the most dominant player of all time. What I mean yeah. by that is he broke for people who are younger and watching this maybe now. Go YouTube where he shatters. He shatters rims, even when he's got that thin athletic build. He shatters the backboard. He brings down the whole rim. They had to re-fortify the court itself. They had to change the game. They came up with the hack-a-shack strategy of just fouling the man because of how different he was. I mean, they, they just fouled him because, again, he didn't put in that work like you're saying of free throws, the way Kobe would put in work for free throws. He doesn't do it. So, by the way, Shaq said he made all. By the way, Shaq would argue you. He did say that he did make them all in practice. He's just one of those guys. Actually, I read a really great article a few years ago by one of the smartest basketball minds, uh, John Hollinger, who really broke down the stats of how free throws are just challenging for tall dudes because of their particular ratio from that distance. That. It is a measurable trend, and it's related to the mechanics of their shooting. Now, a really great center will learn how to change their mechanics. But he says across NBA history, so many seven-footers have not been phenomenal free-throw shooters, except for some greats like Kareem, who are great shooters as a whole, because there's something unique about the, the mechanics of shooting a free-throw and the distance and angle at that height that, that hurts their accuracy. And guys like Shaq, who didn't care about it, didn't really adjust. But Shaq will joke and say that he made them all in practice. He also says he made – also, when you rib him, he'll say even on today on, a, on the TNT show, he'll be like, I made all the ones that counted. <laughs> yeah, but duly noted, however, we have the example that Malcolm Gladwell has, has documented 
very much in his work with his David and Goliath book and his his articles at The New Yorker. He tells the story that I used in a research project before and even shared with uh, folks in, in Bible study to tell them how different people react differently to peer pressure. Wilt the Stilt, his amazing 100-point game. I don't know if you know this about it. The reason he has such a great game that led to 100 points and the reason he never um, got 100 again is very interesting. So Rick Barry, the guy's jersey who I'm wearing, is one of the highest free throw shooters of all time. Super intelligent dude, has kids and grandkids who played ball too. He shot the granny style, that underhand style. Mm -hmm. And with that style, he coached Wilt the Stilt, and he trained Wilt the Stilt to change his shooting percentage, which was averaging in the 40s to the high 80s, I think 87.5% in that game. And the reason it changed is because he switched to that grandma style, even with that seven foot height that he had. Well, it, it, and, like, and hold on, hold on, minutes. hold on. Every one of his boys and everyone who he encountered shamed the shit out of him. And he never <laughs> shot that style again. And because he never shot that style again, his free throw shooting went down. He never had another, not even close to another hundred point game. Well, yeah, I think he had but, like thirty five free throws in a hundred point game. It was a, it was a lot of free throws. It was a lot, and he shot all of them in that granny style that he learned from Rick Barry, who coached him. So well, I think Wilt, that's I an think interesting Wilt, counterpart Wilt, of that. Wilt has like every record for seventy plus point games. He's got like thirty of them. But I yep. think Wilt learned what Young Jordan learned, which was. Man, I ain't winning from all this scoring. And, you know, I think that Will, I mean, damn, when you look at his career, I was getting ready for this. I was doing my mom, beatballref.com. Beatball they have a player comparison feature. So I popped up a few sentences to look at numbers. And, like, man, I was looking at Will's career average. I'm like, dude, his career average is, is 30 and 20. His yeah. career, the whole cumulative of, of, of being washed and a rookie. So his peak is so high. For example, like Raiders football, up until five or six years ago, people who follow football, the Raiders have been a terrible football team since 2003, one of the worst in football. But they were such a great football team to the 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s that even with all of their losing in the mid-2000s, they still were a top-five franchise because the cumulative effect of how much they won still lifted up all their really horrible losing. And I think Wilt's the same way, like, oh, my God, his peak is so obnoxiously high that he, washed Will doesn't erase peak Wilt, and his career numbers look absurd. But we so why, why Kareem better? You know, is Kareem better because of the all-time scoring? What's that? Why is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar better than Wilt the Stilt? Because Kareem had longevity and was just a scorer, though. I actually I did not believe that LeBron James could top Kareem's number because whenever you look at the guys who come close to Kareem, they're still so far away from him that they're like never going to touch him. And yet all it takes for LeBron to beat Kareem is the average 21 points a game for the next three years. Is that something LeBron can do if he chose to? Yes. I don't even know he will, but it's, it points out how unique Kareem's is that it's going to take somebody doing something as all time great as Kareem did to even sniff it. But Kareem is just such a unique singular, silky smooth score. Will is a version of Shaq in a different era. He is just dominating through physicality and athleticism against a bunch of six foot five half professional white guys. And we gotta be, and I mean, there's eight teams in the league. Like the competition is just not what it can be. And it's not a knock on Will. For me, Will makes, I, I, don't, I don't even count NBA before the 70s. I, I know everyone loves Celtics and all their championships. I don't even count Lakers five from the fifties. Like, you know, I love George Milken. He's, he, he, he's a, he was one of the first superstar players in NBA history. But if we're really honest with ourselves, you can't start counting NBA to the seventies when it, when it became something a little more like it is. And even then, I mean, one of the things that Jordan was talking about last dance is people doing cocaine and drinking yeah. on, on the road. Like really basketball doesn't become a, a truly athletic professional game to the late eighties and nineties when the kind of party atmosphere and half professional atmosphere goes away. So as much as, you know, Celtics fans want to love Bill Russell and all the championships, you know, you segue into what I was going to ask you segue after what you're going to say segue into why you think Timmy D is better than Bill Russell and then add Kevin Garnett to that. I think Bill Russell's a center. I don't think Bill Russell's a power forward. So that, that in, that in of itself is part of that equation. Um, why does Tim Duncan better than Kevin Garnett? I mean, I don't like to do this, but five better than one. 
And, I mean, that's why we're giving it to Jordan above LeBron, right? Yeah. I mean, we can be very transparent. I, Jordan's the go for success, but LeBron is a better basketball player. LeBron yeah. just happened to play in a more competitive era where the dudes he's playing against are, are, are also good. And so I'm not going to say LeBron is more successful than Michael Jordan, and Le Jordan is indisputably the GOAT for his success. But if we're talking about just apples for apples, fundamental basketball skill and IQ, LeBron is a more versatile, talented player. But Jordan translated his talent into more success than LeBron's been able to. Now, if LeBron magically wins three more championships, which I ain't saying he's going to do, but if he does, or if he had won three more than he did, we wouldn't be saying Michael Jordan is indisputably the GOAT. Because Ka suddenly Kawhi might have something to say about that. Kawhi right? might have something. <laughs> so the truth of the matter is, I gotta give Timmy over KG because you know, count the rings, man. Spurs success yeah. speaks for itself, man. Twenty so, years. So the rings, the rings is a good point, and I think that like all-time scoring and rings, these are like factors that we're looking at that are specific and measurable. I mentioned two players earlier who are two of my favorite, not necessarily like as good as Bill Russell and Kevin Garnett, but they're two of my favorite players. And they're my favorite because I love people who are slashers and defenders. Those are my favorite players. And these are two slashers at the four position who are absolutely dominant. Tell me, tell me your thoughts to the people with much less rings. Blake Griffin, who's here right now, and Sean Kemp back in the day with a super with the extinct supersonics. I think that Blake also really played a lot of small forward, though. I mean, he's more versatile. Than nah, he's, he's four more five. four. He's more four, though. He's played three. Um, he's more of a proper four, I think. He's a little big for the three. I think that. I think that. That Sonics team. That's another thing for the last dance. That Sonics team w w was underrated for how good it was in its time, and what it was able to do, especially uh, defensively. Um, Gary Payton. Yep. I, I think that 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 a player like Kemp and and the glove really fall off of GOAT list precisely because I mean we do have to use championship success as mm -hmm. a barometer. And that's a conversation I have with myself get ready for this. I'm like, I have a few non ring I have a few non championship players on my all time top fifteen. But it's because watching them play oh. is going to Oh, it's gotta be the top one. Um are the top player not a ring? Definitely. Arkley, yeah. Definitely, In because watching opinion. him play, he's who he was. Like, yeah. so like, but there's only so many room for ringless guys on that list because <laughs> at the end of the day, rings count for something. And when we're not talking about guys who just got one on the bench, I mean, when we're talking about a star player earning a ring, it's got to be higher than a star player who may have been better than them but couldn't get that ring. So, like, that, just to jump in to, to relate to that conversation of Kemp, like, why is yeah. Kemp not going to make my top five? Because he can't make my top ten because he can't be better than Shaq. It can't be better than KG to me because KG make your top five at that position because so, he definitely would for me. I think that KG is my is my is my second best power forward because of his singular success, his championship pedigree, and the fact that he just was such a unique force in and really being a part of what's going to become the small ball era, being a more versatile big man that could do the things that small ball requires do small ball defense you know still be a fulcrum on offense you what know about i didn't worm? like kg for a long time kg for those guys that earned my respect too but what about the back in retrospect, rodman who we saw in the last dance i love rodman there's too many guys that are going to be ahead of him on a power forward really? list put rodman on that rodman is yeah. a great guy but that's going to happen with any guy that's literally uh, uh, any guy that's your, your defensive player of the year is going to have a problem being on a GOAT list because by default, they're like a villain. Like getting a defensive player of the year is like the anti-MVP, right? I like, like it. Yeah, the, I like it. Like you're by the, like, and that's the reason it makes Jordan so unique. Like he got he had it, yeah. And really he got that in the 80s. People forget, like he didn't get that when it's peak, but when you watch Michael Jordan's guy people play, in fact, that's what divides the two eras of Jordan. Like, well, he got it, Jordan, if you remember, Chris, if you remember, he got it when there was some commentator or some player, I forget who it was, who said, yeah, Jordan's great, but where's his defense? So he got oh, it yeah. out of spite. No, Jordan's an all-time great defender, period. But, like, when he was a defensive player of the year, it was, like, pre-championship Jordan where he was just doing everything. But, like, I think when you watch Jordan and Scottie Pippen on the 96, 97, 98 run, the combination, like, the first, the first Bulls was an offensive team. They played great defense, but they were an offensive team. 96, 97, 98 Bulls are like one of the best defensive teams of all time. And it's because they brought in yeah. Robin and Phil Jackson last night. That's what Robin. I would have seen live. The other and, stuff and, I and, saw on the videotapes from my dad and my uncle. 
the 80s yeah, stuff Jackson I was not said, alive for. Phil Jackson said last dance that Dennis Rodman was the single greatest defender he'd ever seen play, as in one-to-one defender. Like, you need, you need one guy to get one stop against anybody on the other team. Dennis Rodman was that guy. But by default, you can't be a GOAT if your specialty is thwarting GOATs. Because first and foremost, why do I not put Curry on my GOAT list? Everybody on our top 10 and 15 are two-way players. Basketball is a two-way sport. The only guy who sneaks in there is a guy like Magic, who is not a great defender. Was, you know, used his size to hang. Big, yeah, he's big. Yeah, like he's not a defensive liability, but he's not a defender. But Magic is just so indisputably great. Kareem, else. Kareem was a defender. Kareem was a defender. He could do his job if he had to because he had enough size to leverage it and yeah. within the Lakers had. Plus, yeah. 80s was about defense anyway, so we're not going to knock Magic about that. I think if he needed to, he would have developed the talent. He wasn't asked to do it. But yeah. like basketball is a two-way sport, and you got to be an all-time great defender as well as score to really make an all-time list. And by default, that means that if you're Dennis Rodman, you're an all-time great defender, but you win an all-time great score. And so I, I got to knock you down the list from guys who did Dang. it both. So, he, he's like, high up there for me, but I, I respect why you put him down. Someone who plays both sides, but also goes back to that what-if thought experiment that you said earlier. I don't know if it's uh, you know, uh, a deuteronomical, uh, not a deuteronomical. What would we call a, like a deutero canon? I want to say an yeah, apocryphal. I don't know works. if it's an. Yeah. I don't know if it's deutero an apocryphal canon works quote. Like su- a supplemental. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's an apocryphal quote, but I've heard that Phil Jackson, who coached both Kobe, who's got to be up there in our conversations, and MJ, said that if he ever gave a damn, Rashid Wallace would have been the goat. Um, because of the way that he plays a defense, his defensive rebounding, offensive rebounding, his blocking, his shooting from three, and his shooting from mid range. But he just said he smoked too much weed and was just too lazy all the time. Wow, she, she, again, because she found his niche, which was being a DYOP, being that kind of specialist and saying, I'm going to be, I may not be the best guy in the court, but I'm going to make sure the best guy in the court got to get through me to win this game. And, yep. and, and he's a very underrated player because of that, because like, you know, and he came from an era where if you look at scoring, like that is the most defense, like everyone nostalgizes is the nineties, but the most slug fest in your face, shut it down. Basketball is 2003, four, five, man. When guys are scoring 60, 70 points a game, like basketball yep. got ugly in that era because it was like, like the way now it's too much small ball, too much three point shooting, too much shooting guys ain't even trying to do fundamentals anymore in regards to like getting in the paint. Well, that's what happened in the mid two thousands. Of like, people just stopped caring about offense altogether. <laughs> I like the way uh, Bomani Jones, my favorite voice in sports. Folks right here don't want to listen to Bomani Jones. You need to check out Bomani Jones, folks out there. He is the smartest voice in sports commentary. Right? He was a professor, got into sports as a hobby. His voice is, is second to none, and his acumen about sports and his sense of humor as well. He put out a little YouTube series, at ESPN, um, called uh, Bulldozed about all the teams Jordan beat. And he made a joke and me laugh my ass off about about the 90s Knicks saying they're that team that just didn't care at all about trying to score. <laughs> and I think that like 2000s basketball, everybody wanted to be the Knicks. Who cares about scoring? Just stop the other guy. And so, I was like, shook by that 2004 Pistons team because as a Los Angelino, we had a Lakers squad with Rick Fox was the worst player. We had Shaq. We had Carl yeah, Malone. That was a hurtful loss, we man. That was a dominant team. team. We had all these people, Kobe, and for me, yes, they're all out of their prime, right? Except for Kobe no, and Shaq. They were still playing great. They still yeah, played great that year, they though. They played like, yeah. so great. And Ben Wallace and Rashid Wallace, Rick Hamilton, these cats destroyed them, and they destroyed them with defense. I remember Rick Hamilton has his almost his like whole palm on Kobe's face the whole time while he's guarding him. The way they played ball, I'll tell you what I learned about the last dance because I was old enough to perfectly remember that defeat that the Pistons gave. But I didn't know about the bad boys when Dennis Rodman was there back in the day. Like I had heard about the bad boys and you hear and you see highlights, but I didn't see it the way they did. And I didn't realize that they like stopped the bulls with like basically beating them up, beating them up with uh, much less rules that were back in the day. It's a little exaggerated. If I could be very honest with you and their tough guy persona, like created created a narrative that that exaggerated it too but they were definitely a singularly physical team and it's no coincidence that it's both those Detroit teams that had that unique beat them up identity and that the that the that the that the, that the 2000s Pistons you know reincarnated that same mindset it should be noted 
that the that the the bad boy Pistons could score, by the way, and, and they were an underrated offensive team, but they played a high offensive era. But they were one of the first teams to switch it to that 90s style of gumming it up, you know, making a physical. 80s basketball, aside from nostalgia, just take my word for it, people. Go on Hardwood Classics, go on YouTube, watch some 80s basketball, and I don't care. I'll take the Pepsi Challenge. You're going to find a lot of two on, a one-on-one and eight guys standing around waiting for their turn. You're not going to see a lot of ball movement on both sides. You're not going to see a lot of rotations on defense. You're not going to see a lot of high-quality basketball. And it's not a diss. That's just what that era was about. Yeah, there some really yeah great one perspective of what high-quality basketball is, which is the, the general movement or progress. You know, these things, you're a historian. So, you know, we can talk about how some people have this overly, like, positivist, progressive view of history where they think, you know, history is headed in one direction only. And then you see the election of a Donald Trump and they're like, oh, well, none of my friends was going to vote for him. So I didn't think that that was even a possibility. How could we be mm. so Philistine? How could we be so Neanderthal to vote for such a person? And, and yet that's, you know, that's that Fukuyama view of history that what the current democracies we have now is, is the end of history. And I think that's a, a certain level of arrogance, whereas I think these things are more pendulum-like. And I wonder if we'll go to a slower, bigger man version of the NBA. And I think part of that's also the, the ever-changing rule sets, right? I think another thing whenever we're talking about Jordan is we can never forget like that three seconds in the paint rule, right? That is not remember, But remember, they changed the rules in response to unique talents on the court. So the rules don't change the game. The rules change as a response to the game changing. So they didn't change the rules and then the game changed. It's that these things were happening from a few really great players and they got to change the rules to try to slow down those guys. And then when the rule changes, it changes and also the influence of those guys. For example, like everybody shoots threes. It ain't just Steph Curry. That was a trend that has been going on for 15 years in the NBA. But Steph Curry became the face of it. And he's one of the first guys to just embody it. And now his name's attached to it, even though, you know, guys like Ray Allen and Reggie Miller before him who were those guys and also better defenders, you know, they don't get the credit for being a part of that. But, you know, the change in the game, you know, just like anything in history, it's not the guy's name. The guy's name gets attached to it. So the, the rules change, but they change them in response to a few players, including the three-second rule. Like, that was a change in a response to the fact that big dudes could just stand there and grab rebounds and box out and block shots, and it was boring. And it's what led to that boring 2000s. I, I don't think it's boring. Celebrate. That's one opinion. I, 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 I'm a big believer in bringing that back. I'm a street rules guy. I know you play some street ball too, some pickup. I like but anyway, big guys like, on their feet though, man. Big guys on their feet are what make guys like Kareem and Hakeem so great, right? Them guys have yeah, footwork. But like they did else. it during a different time in a rule set. Uh, we're going to wrap up quickly, but there are two guys yeah. I cannot, I cannot um, you know, not delve into deeper. So here's my otter picks. I'm going to throw them in the top five at their position, but I'm going to go back to your standard that you put earlier, and I'm going to admit to you that a large part of why they're there is because of defense. One of them is there because of offense and defense. He's got that both sides of the coin like you mentioned. The other one is just straight defense, but it's at such a high level, and it's got respect from high accolades. So I think we would agree that Kobe – is number two. You can tell me otherwise after I say this. And I think he's got really good defense and offense displayed. Now, Kobe Bryant is quoted as saying that the greatest defender he's ever played against, and he didn't even mention Rick Hamilton, who I mentioned earlier, who was great and shot the three well, but he said it was Tony Allen. Oh, he so, hated Tony Allen. Yeah, he's, he acknowledged him as the greatest defender. I saw a live game of uh, Memphis Gri Grizzlies against Clippers a few years back. And I remember this man, Tony Allen, karate kicked um, Chris Paul in the face when Chris Paul was on the Clippers. And I remember Chris Paul might seem short to y'all, but this man's at least six foot or 5'11", minimum 5'10". Oh, Chris, Paul, Chris Paul's like six foot three, bro. bro the little some people think little, he's short. Some people think he's short. And I know the on TV, man. I met Steve Nash and he's six foot five, man. He looks like a little white guy on TV, but yeah. man, he's as tall as a door, so bro. How, you look up to him. However tall he is, if he's taller, it makes this even funnier. Tony Allen told the ref it was an accident. And in that oh, moment, yeah, I, I love that now. Yes. I love Tony Allen. 
But how do you kick a six foot or six foot plus man in the face on accident? That's just hilarious to me. So I throw him in my top five purely on defense and based off of Colby, who I consider number two at that position of shooting guard, acknowledging him as the toughest defender he's he's ever had to face. And and he's faced Jordan. Yeah. I think that – so my, my second team, and this is the one where there's so much more wiggle room, and it's just about you had to see these guys play. My second greatest point guard of all time is my respect to John Stockton because, man, holy shit, if he did not singularly win some games against the Lakers and other great teams, we were just like, this white boy could hoop. So, like, Stockton earned my respect by just watching him play basketball, and he is, like, the original definitive 3 and D kind of guy. Stockton's defense is so underrated. He was a spicy defender. He averaged two steals a game for his career. Like, he would get the steal and make the layup on the other end or the perfect pass. And he was an early three-point shooter, just wasn't allowed to get the lights out. Like, so many I, – I love it when you watch some old heads. They're like – players, I mean, they're like, man, they didn't let us shoot those threes. Like, oh, my God, even Steve Nash was like, dude, if they let me shoot more, I'd probably be like Steph Curry because he averaged 40% from three. But no man, well, even, even never Mike Dantoni's offense let Steve Nash shoot the ball. He had to pass it. So, like, oh, my God, if John Stockton had took five or six threes a game, like dudes take today – he would yeah. be known for that because he was shooting 40% for a large part of his career. I distinctly have memories of John Stockton just getting a steal and shooting a pull-up three the way people think of, like, a pull-up three from James Harden. And, like, when Stockton shot that shot, you knew it was going in. When Stockton got that steal, you knew something was going to happen on the fast break. So he gets my respect, even though he's never won a championship, because I can't think of a point guard that's truly better than John Stockton that's not named Magic Johnson. I can think of guys that are great point guards that deserve to be on a list of top 10 point guards but they can't take it from John because he took it from people. So Stockton's my point guard. Kobe definitely the shooting guard. I mean, who's going to be a, a second better shooting guard? My small forward is going to be respect to Larry Bird, even though we could have some conversations about other small forwards out there. Um, my power forward is going to be KG, who I added that list out of big respect. Um, though I used to put uh, Carl Malone on that list out of the same respect for Stockton. When you watch Carl Malone play basketball, you're Does like, you more the, Oh, for the four. Yeah. For the four, for the power four. Like Carl Malone was like, who's stopping this guy? The mailman. I, I love his nickname, bro. Who has that nickname? Especially he delivered, US, bro. And he, and he's he he being discussed in the news nowadays. So and he, uh, he's a bad, he's a bad human being and he deserves no respect as a human being. He's a despicable person, by the way. He's not like, I didn't know that. Reasons. I didn't know that. Uh, I don't know the thing in the news. But as a basketball player, he, he should be on somebody's top 20 list for sure. Um, so I, I, I rotate between KG and, and, and Malone for that. You know, and, five. and my five is going to be Shaq because who's stopping Shaq? Mm-hmm. Like Shaq will be in my all time if he just care about basketball. I think that leads me to my third team just to kind of even it out. And this is where things can rotate. Like for point guard, I like to respect a player like Jason Kidd, who was versatile in different eras, got a championship, took some raggedy teams in the finals before that is in the top five for assists, was a two-way player, had some defensive skills, but you could talk me a few beers into a lot of guys above kid. I just have a personal respect for him. Yeah, for I, see, I see you speaking our white brothers in there. I, lo- I appreciate it. <laughs> for shooting guards, we're talking about Flash, Dwayne Wade, indisputably, third grade shooting guard. I mean, who's up there? Drexler? Like, who's going to take it from Wade? He's the guy. Small forward, I'm putting Scotty P up in there. And I, I put was going to say, where Scotty? I was going to ask about Scotty. Like, he, re- he, really, he really should take it from Larry. But we, we, we have the argument of, well, was Scotty doing it because he had Jordan and vice versa? So, like, Larry did it on his own. I got to give Larry the nod for Scotty. There's, but a, Scottie- there's a chemistry factor there, but you got to give him his due. And especially yeah. the fact that I didn't realize how underpaid he was until I watched the last Oh, my game. God. Scotty, I, I remember being, I love Scotty as a kid. Scotty was my favorite. I, I was visceral, even as a kid, about how mad how mad I was that Scotty not only never got the money, but never got the credit he deserved. And it, it always hurt my feelings because he was such a great real player. Ones, I no. He was real, a guy real named real no. How about number like, number four, third team, and number five, third team? So my third team is going to then be my four is going to be we're going to either flip out, you know, Carmelo and KG. Maybe mm-hmm. a few beers you could talk me into a dirt and whiskey in there, but since he's not a yeah. two way player. You know, I'd be giving him respect because of, of things he did well, but am I going to put him Man. above a guy like Even in his last year. His last year would shock me, yeah. yeah. Um, my center, and this is a guy who's my personal favorite center, but I, I can't put him above the guys I have above him, and that's Akeem the Dream. You know, his skill set, his ability to play modern basketball, his footwork, his versatility, his defense, like 
Hakeem Olajuwon would be people's GOAT if he was able to have more success. He's that Wilt Chamberlain kind of guy. Like, if he had one more, yeah. if, he had, if he had had it, he would be the GOAT. And, by the way, a lot of Jordan stands won't admit, but Michael Jordan is quoted by people saying that the only player that scared him in the 90s was Hakeem Olajuwon and that he was glad that he was in his retirement. I'm not saying Jordan retired and not play Hakeem. I'm saying that had Jordan played Hakeem, he probably would have lost to Hakeem. Because the disease of me takes in, fatigue, battle tests. Like, people have this myth that Jordan would have won eight, ten championships. No, you would have watched him lose. He would have won well, more again. Maybe seven. Hakeem, maybe, Hakeem maybe seven. Would, maybe seven. Maybe but, the seven uh, was fair, but I'm talking about those one. Like, yeah. you can't take those two from Hakeem. He yeah. would have got them. It was Hakeem's time. Yeah. It would have been interesting because he was nice even when he came back and he was on the Wizards. I remember there's one time where he jumped up and he beat somebody's shit on the backboard and ripped it out of their hands. And I said, whoo! <laughs> like, that was in the 2000s, in the early 2000s. He was, he was, on the was a soccer player in college. He never played basketball in Africa in his life. He was a soccer player. And they got from a basketball scholarship, so he learned to play basketball just to, like, get that career opportunity. Yeah. And he learned by default that his athleticism allowed him to be a unique basketball player. But my opinion is his singular skill as a soccer. He, he played basketball like a soccer player. And yeah. he had that sense of court but Hashim, Hashim the Beat tried that. But Hashim the Beat ended up failing out of the NBA. So Hashim well, he's not Hakeem. By the way, yeah. in basketball terms, I know we both that. So let's call it our two-minute two minute warning dose, like in Miami Heat era. So, like, you know, my my – my bottom three, my, my third team, you know, that's where there's a lot more debate and wiggle room. And that's yeah, why I like I'm the it mostly the same as yours. The only place I'll differ is I'm going to throw Yao Ming in the mix of those centers. For me, that final playoff where his knees blew out, it was so devastating to me. And Matumbo got injured too. I, was, I wasn't I was a Rockets fan, but I was a fan of that team. And I used to use them in NBA 2K all the time. And for me, his ability just to be lights out from mid-range. I mean, one of those playoff games, he was eight for eight from mid-range. And then his his dominance, like we talked about dominance as a factor inside the paint, it was just a monstrosity. And then I will throw somewhere in the top five at the three position. People going to get mad at me for this. Andre Igodala, who I was talking about earlier as a slasher and a defender, who after 10 years of like really dominance, uh, a dominant game with like Philly and everything, finally gets his MVP in the playoffs with the Warriors that I thought was respectable so late in his career. And, and now he's in Miami. I, I copped a, a Miami Vice jersey of his just because of how clean the colors look. So that that those are the last people I want to talk about was Ego Dala and Yao Ming. I think Iggy definitely got. I mean, Warrior himself was going to the Warriors that boosted his career, but you know people forget how good he was in Philadelphia. So like, he certainly, you With know, we're talking about Young and Dalembert, and if we're talking I, about the sixth was, man of the year goats, you know, we're talking about if we're talking about the the Jamal Crawfords and Lou Williams and 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 the Iguodalas and, and those kind of guys, like that's where he shot. Oh my god! Like, and the Spur, don't don't get me twisted. What's his name? I forgot his name. Ginobili, Manu. Yeah, I know Ginobili is a guy that that I think made a career of being a six man and and wouldn't be as famous if he just started because I'm not dissing his skill set, but he took advantage of that. Agreed. You know, I, I I at the end of the day, I think for me, what makes you a goat is can you hang maybe not win but can you hang with the other goats will it be a competitive game you know uh, in fact i'm sorry i, I just discharged barkley off my power for list and i just realized that when bring him up that i put him on my list before when i realized i was dissing him he deserves to be on there at least the third if not the second team is he third all. though because he didn't he didn't meet your ring category yeah, right? I, just realized zero, right? I forgot that i changed my list over the years and that in reality i have yeah. that respect for barkley going back to his stats that he should definitely either be on my third team, if not my second, for what he was yeah. able to do, especially under at size. least top five, at least top five, because the ring yeah. we mentioned the ring thing as a big factor. Well, I'm going by position, so he can't usurp. You know, he ain't gonna take it from Timmy, but no, he certainly yeah. can have a. He he certainly basically. I forgot he played on a power forward. I was thinking of the small forward. He ain't taking it from Larry Bird and LeBron. Four. Yeah, he but was, then I realized that the round, his round, numbers, round. Like, oh, he's a power forward, and he could take it from power forwards for sure. But, you know, again, what makes you a goat and a baby goat is you may not be the goat, but you're going to hang with the goat. And you're going to make the goat respect you. And, like, you know, he's going to get it from you. And all the players that I've shared and we've talked about and several players you shared, whether they're the greatest all time, they weren't they, – they, they didn't look sloppy against them. And I think for me what makes you a goat, you know, what makes you my top five team, you can play in any era. That top five team we, that we shared in common – 
those guys could start at that position in today's basketball or in 60s basketball or 80s basketball 100%. or whatever era, and they would have the skill set and the talent and the athleticism and the IQ to make it work. So Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, LeBron James, Tim Duncan, and, ha- and Kareem, they could play any era of basketball and would be just as good, maybe even better, if they played in a different era. And so they got it. I guess our next conversation should be the evolution of basketball from a bunch of dudes standing around to this whirling, complex basketball machine we call pace and space with three-point shooting. But I guess that's another great conversation. So I'm going to sign it off to you and our, and our audience out there tonight. 